Thanks for joining us on Live with Squacky. I'm Val Kelly, otherwise known as Squacky Voice, and I'm so excited about our very special guest today. We have Daniel Ross, who is playing some super iconic characters, and I can't wait to hear all about his story. He's originally from Maryland, so he's a mid-Atlantic guy from the start and living out in L.A. and living the dream, so I can't wait to hear all about it. So thanks for joining us today, Daniel. Whoop, whoop, Mid-Atlantic! <laughs> awesome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So let's start out by having you tell us a bit about your background and how you got started in the voiceover industry. My goodness, that's a broad question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I guess we have to start at the beginning. I was born <laughs> in 1980 to two parents. Um, no, I, uh, I was uh, always kind of a, a, a theater guy. Um, I grew up loving, uh, you know, on stage performances. I was a bit of a troublemaker. I used to do prank phone calls when I was a kid and, uh, you know, get myself in plenty of trouble. And uh, it, it only uh, occurred to me later in life that uh, uh, that would be the uh, beginnings of an acting career. Uh, <laughs> So I studied musical theater in college and uh, I dropped out so that I could pursue film. Uh, so I went from musical theater to film and did a lot of extra work, stand-in work in the DC Baltimore area. And uh, eventually I uh, partnered with uh, my best friend and decided we were gonna start making our own content. So I started producing films, uh, starting with Ninjas vs. Zombies, a, a schlocky independent horror comedy which got some footing and uh gosh like nine films later that i produced um i i decided voiceover was really the place that i wanted to put my efforts in and uh i i was blessed in 2007 uh to get my first big role in uh transformers the game as uh starscream and i don't know if you can tell i'm a big transformers fan i have a <laughs> I even have some ink. I have Cybertrodian on me. So I'm a big Transformers geek. And that was just like amazing to me. Totally. Uh, and that kind of bit the bug. And I, and I said, yeah, I really need to pursue this voiceover thing. And uh, here we are. That's my background. Amazing. <clears throat> That's so great. Um, so what made you, so all of that made you decide to pick up from Maryland and move to LA? Or did you move to LA before you started producing films? So Los Angeles was kind of like that far away dream. You know, maybe someday I'll, I'll get out to LA and take my shot and see what happens. <laughs> and uh, honestly, it, it, took a, it took a series of unfortunate events uh, for me to, uh, I guess, decide that it was time to take that shot. Um, I, I don't mean to uh, perpetuate a sad story. My, my mom had uh, been diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, my grandfather had passed away. I was out of a, a, a long-term relationship. And after I uh, helped my mom to heal and uh, got myself in a better place, I just said, you know what? The time is now. And uh, I, I shaved most of my head and had a mohawk for a while. And, you know, <laughs> living the wildlife and, and said, let's do this. Let's go to LA. And I packed up my car with what I had and I drove cross country and uh, just said, here I am. Let's see what happens. <laughs> um, so, you know, I worked overnights uh, at Target managing the logistics process with the trucks coming in and, and, you know, pushing the freight and all the, all the products to the floor. And, so I would work from, you know, 10 p.m. till 8 a.m. every single day, but I had my days free to audition and network and do all those crazy things. So I was burning the candle at both ends while I was <laughs> young. <laughs> cool. That's, that's so, um, it's so inspirational, honestly, to hear that you were able to make it work, you know, because I think that a lot of... Surprisingly. Yeah, a lot of voice actors, I mean, you hear a lot of stories of people I, I feel like I've heard some stories at least not necessarily a lot of people being like that's it I'm going I'm packing my car and I'm moving to LA and I've you know I've heard of a couple people doing it at least three or four who if not more have picked up and done that and they're doing great you know you guys are doing great and I'm kind of like hmm maybe I should just <laughs> and my family's like no 
We don't have an object. Just, right. just a, a yeah. point there. I, you know, it was very important to me to make sure that I had the wherewithal to succeed. Yeah. And when I when I talk to people about the move to LA, I always say save your money, make yeah. sure you have an emergency fund. And for some people, that's not easy. Right. Um, so, like as an example, I had a credit card that had airline miles that I would use on the regular, so that in case something happened, I at least had a ticket home. Right. You know, if if, yeah. if everything else failed, I had a ticket home, and I could take that worry out of my brain and let the creativity thrive. So, you know, anything that you can do in terms of removing obstacles of fear, I, I think will help you in that process of, of succeeding or at least getting to where you want to be. Right. Definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's really a good idea and good advice to have a backup plan just in case it doesn't, you know, but I'm, I'm so happy for you that it's working and that you're doing really well. So. Thank you. One of your most iconic roles that you're performing is the voice of one of my favorite characters ever, Donald Trump. <laughs> so can you tell us the story of how you booked that role and what the experience has been like? Oh my goodness. Um, uh, job of a lifetime, dream come true. Many people who know me have heard this story before, but Donald Duck was the very first voice I ever learned how to do, and my mom taught me how to do it. So when I was a kid, she would tuck me in at night and say, Oh, kid, I love you so much. And, and I'd say, Oh, Mom, I love you too. And we would go back and forth, and you know, it was a parlor trick for friends, and uh, it was just something that was always in my repertoire and people would say, Hey, do the Donald thing, do the Donald thing. And you know, I break <laughs> it out. Um, and it was always fun. And so, you know, I moved here to LA and, uh, uh, my agent knew that I did that and the audition crossed her path. And she said, Hey, uh, at the time my agent's name was Michaela Stepanovich and, uh, uh, you know, she was great and she put this in front of me and said, you know, give it, give it a shot. And I'm looking at this audition and I'm thinking to myself, how is this possible? These characters are like Supreme Court nominations. You're, you're in for life. And uh, so, you know, my first inclination was excitement. Uh, and then, of course, I was a little concerned uh, for, for Tony Anselmo. I was thinking, oh, my gosh, I hope he's OK. Yeah, nothing's, you know, nothing's wrong. Um, but anyways, I, I went through the audition process. It was arduous. Uh, I was called back a couple different times. And uh, there was a musical callback where I had to sing. And uh, I'll never forget, I was visiting Maryland, uh, I was visiting family in Maryland, and I get the call from my agent saying, hey, can you be there tomorrow, you know, for, for this musical callback? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I said, I'm in Maryland. And she said, don't worry, they'll wait for you. And I'm like, oh, they'll oh, wait for me. Oh, they'll okay. wait for you. <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I, I did my due diligence. I rehearsed so hard because I wanted this part so bad. Uh, yeah. Every day in the gym, I'm running just a little bit faster. Like, I've got to get this. I've got to get this. And uh, initially, it was difficult to, I guess, master some of the Donald-isms. Right. Um, doing an impression and then turning it into the actual character are very different things. And it was discovering a whole new world while I was doing that. So it was a learning, there was a learning curve as I was going through this process. Um, but the production team was just so wonderful and kind. And uh, uh, it's just been an amazing experience ever since then. Um, talk about life changing. And, uh, you know, given what I said about my mom and, and the experience with her cancer, um, she was always my creative inspiration. Um, every day I would come home from school, she'd be drawing, sketching, painting, sculpting ceramics. And uh, th there was always something that I really loved about that. And after the cancer, unfortunately, you know, her creativity diminished. And uh, it, was, it was sad because she was in pain a lot after the surgery. So when this happened, I got to fly her out to LA took her to Disney Studios where all the legends handprints are and got to walk around and that spark kind of came back. Yeah. And we went to the production house and she met the executive producers and got to see everybody drawing and doing the storyboards. And uh, that was just 
that was so fulfilling for me to be able to kind of give that back and have the story come full circle. Um, but it's just, it's been one heck of a heck of a ride and I'm just, I'm honored to be doing it and I hope to do it for as long as they let me. <laughs> Absolutely. What a great story. That's so exciting. I'm so happy for you. That's really great. Like I'm always so happy to see, um, you know, when, when people say like, Oh, you know, what do you want to do? I want to do this. And it's like, some people might be like, Oh, that's just a dream that you have, you know, but to see people actually take their dreams and follow them and fulfill them. It's like so inspiring. And it just is a, a life lesson to just never give up on what you want to do. You know, if you really want to make it happen, you just train for it, work hard for it and just go for it. And it sounds like that's exactly what you did. So that's great. Thank you. Yeah. The, the mechanism uh, the Bukal speech is what is what it's called, but the, the mechanism that I used, I never anticipated using it for Donald, so I was like, well, how can I reappropriate this and use it for voiceover? And uh, it, it turned into being able to bark like a pug. Um, so, 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 you know, my, in my uh, uh, demo reel, I would bark like a pug, and it would be like, you know, it was very simple, but it was like, okay, I can use it for that because the Donald voice is, is taken by somebody else. Uh, right. And here we are. <laughs> and here you are. Fantastic. So um, we talked a little bit about this already, but you're also a live action on screen actor. So what have some of your most interesting roles been and how would you say that your on screen work differs from your voiceover work? That's a great question. Um, there's a big difference uh, between on camera and voiceover. Um, and it's, it's a learning process. So I, I kind of say that voiceover is like getting your doctorate. Uh, you know, you go, you, go to, you go to medical school and then you, know, you learn a specialty and you have to learn and train for additional years to be able to do that. Um, acting is the core. And of course, I said I started with musical theater and then transitioned to film and then transitioned to voiceover. And each one of those has different in isms and ins and outs that you have to learn. Um, so, you know, for me, I, I was doing a lot of extra work in D.C. and Baltimore. I worked on the show The Wire for a bunch of years. Uh, um, you know, movies that would come through like Chris Rock's Head of State. Uh, cool. and, and TV movies, like something the Lord made, uh, with the late Alan Rickman and most deaf. Um, so I would do, you know, extra work or stand in work, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't something that I could make a career out of. It was mostly just a hobby. Um, right. cause I worked full time. I, I worked full time in, in retail for well over 10 years and I waited tables and I worked in doctor's offices and, you know, all of that stuff. So it was always what I would do with my free time. And I'll never forget, I had auditioned for an independent film in Baltimore called Crawler, uh, which was done by the late and great Don Dohler uh, and his, his friend uh, Joe Ripple, uh, who created Time Warp Films. And, you know, it was a, it was a campy uh, horror movie and, you know, the, the, the kind that goes straight to DVD. And uh, I met my best friend, Justin Tim Payne. Uh, on that set, and he and I would carpool and talk movies, and, uh, you know, from that point on, the dynamic changed a little bit from, you know, let's see what opportunities come to me, and then changing it to what opportunities can I make for myself, or in that case, what can we make for ourselves, and that's where Ninjas vs. Zombies came along. So uh, I played uh, the, one of the leads in, in that film, uh, uh, Foul Mouth Pizza Delivery Ninja, uh, <laughs> named Kyle. And, uh, you know, we, we continued while the iron was hot. Ninjas vs. Zombies gained, gained an international uh, uh, following. And we followed it up with Ninjas vs. Vampires, which we got on Netflix for a couple of years. Awesome. And uh, I'll never forget, I had some friends in uh, Iraq who were fighting at the time you know, sending me pictures of bootlegged copies of my movie at the <laughs> street vendors. And it was like, hey, I guess I've made it. Awesome. Um, so after that, we did Ninjas vs. Monsters. And, you know, my on-camera career was basically uh, the films that I would produce while I was in that area. So, um, you know, out here in Los Angeles, I, I haven't been focused on that. I really wanted to just laser point my focus on voiceover and make the most out of it. And I think that was the best approach. Um, 
I see a lot of people who, who come out here and they want to do everything. Right. And when you do everything, you spread yourself thin and don't necessarily uh, succeed at all of those things. So I kind of found my niche and, and I decided just to, just to go full steam with that. And that was a good decision. Not to say I don't want to do some more on-camera work uh, in the future. It's something that I absolutely love. Um, I love the camaraderie on a set, you know, with people. I love the, the vibe of creation that everybody has. And uh, I'd love to get back to that at some point. But for now, my focus is exclusively on voiceover and just mastering that side of the craft and, and uh, doing what I can with it. Definitely. Yeah, I think sometimes, like you said, people spread themselves too thin. They have too many directions that they want to go. I'm definitely one of those people. I'm like, let's do this, let's do that, and like, let's run your own company and start your own show and do this. And like, I'm making it work, but it's it's very. I'm very that's not to say yeah. there are people who do that. There are people who are on camera, voiceover, yeah. producing, writing, everything, and they are successful at all of them. Yeah, and I give them all the credit in the world. I just I don't have the energy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Definitely for sure. Um, you know, you have to try to find balance and it sounds like, you know, focusing on one thing is, is definitely a good thing. So from animation to video games, you, you lend your voice to quite a few characters. Do you have a favorite? This is like such a question, right? <laughs> this is the pick. one question that most voice <laughs> actors will dodge uh, <laughs> because we love them all. We, we yeah. love them just the, the process of creation and, and uh, seeing how that resonates with the people that it, that it touches. Uh, I, Donald Duck is my favorite character of all time. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say Donald Duck. Yeah. But I gotta tell you, uh, again, being the giant Transformers fan that I am, uh, what an what a amazing honor it was to be the voice of Starscream for, for a little, yeah. little piece of history, just to, to voice one of those characters that I grew up with and loved. Uh, that was a lot of fun. But there, there are so many, some of which I can't talk about, but uh, right. I, I love all of them. And uh, yeah. <laughs> That's good. So um, can you describe the process of a typical voiceover audition for you at a studio? Well, um, you know, most of the time I'm here in, in my office auditioning. I have a, a, a setup in my closet, uh, which is very comfortable and, and uh, uh, very professional sounding. And that's done very well for me. So most of the time I audition alone. I self-direct. Um, sometimes I go into my agency to record or they'll have a group record. So, you know, I have to have my, my personal skills uh, uh, and acumen, you know, on, on point. Um, but usually when you're in person and you have somebody else recording, you maybe get one or two shots. Okay. When you are recording in your own studio, you've got time to make boo-boos and flub and say, oh, that doesn't work. Let me take five minutes and let me, you know, walk around the house and see, see what comes to me. Um, so I prefer to do it on my own. Um, my creative process, I think, works better with a little bit of time, just ruminating and, and stewing in a character and thinking about all the different odds and ends, you know, thinking about a character's laugh, thinking about a character's backstory, thinking about the pre-life that comes before the lines that I'm actually being given. Um, I like living in that headspace uh, because I think it helps me get a better audition. But that's just me. Some people go into the studio and wham, bam, there it is. Uh, you know, good to go. And I'm always a little bit nervous when I have to go in because I'm like, I like my process. I like yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you say that performing for video games differs from an animated series, like an animated television series? Um, also a very good question. Um, usually for video games, you're recording by yourself. Um, You'll get your lines, you know, uh, uh, sequentially, and there might be a little bit of a description as to what's going on uh, during that moment. But realistically, you, you don't get a script. You don't get a full picture of what the character is unless you just read through all of the dialogue and kind of extrapolate uh, your own tidbits. Now, that's not to say that the company, you know, uh, won't give you a, a description of the character or an idea of what it is that you're doing. Um, but the process is very different and very vocally taxing. 
Um, you know, vocal stress has been a, a big thing that a lot of voice actors have been talking about recently. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you'll go in for a four hour session and it's just, <laughs> okay, can we do that three more times? <laughs> All right, we need 10 more of those, please. And you just go and go and go. Yeah. Um, I haven't experienced that with an animation session, mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, mm-hmm. It's, it's very different. Sometimes you get to do group reads for animation and that is so much fun. It's yeah. so, so much fun because you get to play off of all the different actors and their crazy wacky energies and, and their performances and ad libs. And it's always funny when you're having fun with everybody behind the, in the studio and the director, you know, pushes the button and says, hey guys, can we, can we get to work please? <laughs> <laughs> always so much fun. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of situations where you record by yourself and you have a, a, a very talented voice director. Um, in my case with like Mickey and the Roadster Racers, I'm directed by uh, Kelly Ward, uh, who has worked for so many years in the industry and just has this ability to bring me where I need to be. If I'm not sure of the context of something, he's got it in his head. And he's able to relay that in a way that I'm able to bring out the performance. And, uh, you know, it, it takes a lot, I think, to be a, a, a quality voice director. And we've got so many amazing ones out here in Los Angeles. It's, it's neat to work with them because I learn from them every single time. Um, so, yeah, video games. Uh, you also have a voice director for video games. And, and they do the same kind of thing. But the process is, is very different. It's very different. Okay. If you, um, so if you have a script for a video game and like you said, they're just giving you line after line, but they're not necessarily, do they, do they give you always the whole script or they just give you your line? They just give you your lines, right? So how do you, what's your process of trying to figure out what the, like you said, the backstory is, you know what I mean? Because I've been given auditions like that where it's just your lines. And sometimes I have trouble figuring out like, I mean, sometimes they'll give you like an emotion with the line, you know, but since you don't know like the whole story of what's happening, I find it hard sometimes to really like dissect those lines. And like, I don't know, I obviously it's acting, of course, but I think that's, kind of a struggle that some people have is like how do you interpret what they're trying to ask you to do if they're just giving you your lines you know what I'm saying I do I do and you know what it is daunting when you look at video game copy for the first time uh much like anything you learn you gain experience you start to understand how your mechanism works you know what you're capable of and then start to understand you know, reading between the lines to figure right. things out. So, you know, the direction can be as much as, you know, call out small, call out medium, call out large <laughs> with the line. And, you know, you have to determine uh, the different levels associated with that. But, um, you know, sometimes you'll get a very in-depth description of a character, so in-depth that it actually confuses you, you know, yeah. at, at birth, this character was three pounds, <laughs> five ounces, and in his teens, he was this, and in his 20s, he was that, and, and you know, things that don't necessarily matter to, to, the, the, to the whole picture. I mean, it's helpful to develop a character to get as much information as possible, but I always appreciate when it's clear, concise, uh, you know, give me my archetype. Let me know where this character kind of lives and breathes, and then I can kind of piece those things together myself. Um, but I, I always look for pre-life, post-life. I, I had an audition a couple days ago, which was literally just line, 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 no context. Wow. And, you know, based on the character description and the age of the character, I just kind of had to figure it out. Um, yeah. Now, sometimes they are properties that already exist. So you can go on YouTube and say, hey, who's the voice cast on this? Or... You know, let me watch some uh, some movie clips from the actual uh, video game and see what the tone is. Right. Um, 
you know, there are differences between Disney Junior, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and once you determine what those differences are, you can figure out where that voice is going to live and breathe. So, you know, you have to do some homework um, because it will always be relatively vague, um, or at least that I've come across so far. Um, So, you know, practice makes perfect. The more you do it, the more you're able to read between those lines and uh, extrapolate what it is that you're actually going to do. Yeah, definitely. I hope that answered your question. It, it did, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, and maybe they don't know what they're asking for. And that's a possibility, too, is sometimes, you know, the writer doesn't know what they're looking for until they hear it. So Sometimes, yeah, a lot of the times the writers uh, have an idea of what they want in their mind, and then they hear somebody do a performance, and it's completely changed. Uh, I'll give an example to uh, my movie, Ninjas vs. Monsters, uh, one of my dear friends, Jasmine Guillermo, uh, plays uh, the lead in that. And the character that we wrote was a male character. And uh, she came in and wanted to read for this role and completely knocked it out of the park and made us just walk away scratching our heads thinking, <laughs> this is better than what we had envisioned. So obviously she got the role. And I think that carries over to voiceover as well. Um, you know, may the best person get the role. Um, intuition. Uh, acting skills, um, experience, all of that comes into play when you get into that gray area of I'm not sure what I want to do. For me personally, I'll I'll pick out, you know, a handful of different voices or ranges and I'll see, I'll play with it. I'll see if it works for the character, for the dialogue. Um, Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And if I can't really nail it, then I just rely on my acting experience and, and say, you know what? I'm going to forget about the voice. I'm just going to focus on the acting of this scene and see where it goes. Right. And uh, sometimes that absolutely works. Right. Um, it's definitely voice acting. I think a lot of people miss out on that part. <laughs> There's a lot of different layers to voiceover um, that, that people, are, who, people who primarily do on camera aren't necessarily aware of. Because yeah. when you do on camera, you're emoting with your entire body and uh, you know, doing an emotion. And, and for voiceover, you have to focus that explicitly through your voice. And I'll never forget, I was training, uh, I did a workshop with another uh, fellow Marylander, Sarah Sherman, uh, uh, who's a voice director and casting director out here. And uh, she blew my mind because I was doing this read where I was a teacher in a classroom and I was writing on a chalkboard and handing out papers. And I did this really wacky read and she brought it in and said, I'm not hearing the physicality of this performance. I wanna hear that you're writing on the chalkboard. I wanna hear that you're handing out papers. So what does that sound like? So you're writing on a chalkboard, does it sound like this or does it sound like you're actually, you know, moving your hands and, you know, emphasizing the letters and dotting your eyes. (laughs) Geez, when you're handing out papers, this one's an F and that one's an F. You know, there are all these things that you have to determine um, that may not readily be apparent at the get-go or at a cold read. So I'm always thinking to myself, what is this character doing? What are they yeah. physically doing? Who are they talking to? What's their purpose or intent? Um, what's their motivation? Um, <laughs> you know, and then, and then once that's completed, I'll, I'll start taking a look at the actual character voice and seeing if I can tweak it or, you know, make the age different or do a completely different voice. Um, but not the other way around. I don't think about the voice first. I think about the acting first. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sarah's great. We, um, we had her. Love you, Sarah. Thank you. Yay. Shout out to Sarah. Um, she's fantastic. We've had her at a couple of our conferences, our Mid-Atlantic voiceover conference. And she was, yep. you know, a couple of years ago, but uh, she was back in 2018. And I got to do a session with her and Kari Walgren. And it was, I mean, I was so nervous. It was ridiculous. I was so excited. Like, Because for me, it was like, this is like a dream session. Like, when are you ever going to get to, like, do a training with Kari and Sarah in the same room? It was, I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my gosh, like, how am I going to do this? And, like, it was crazy. But 
Yeah, uh, Kari, Kari is one of the, the hardest working voice actors and one of the most talented people I've ever come across. Uh, in fact, the other night I was actually at her concert. She was doing oh an all cover band of Slaughter called okay. Slaughter. That's and uh, she was just, she, yeah, she was rocking it out. It was awesome. I saw, I saw a video of it on Instagram and stuff like that. She's fantastic. Yeah, yeah really great. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always so much fun to, I think, you know, uh, have the, those training experiences in front of people like that who are, one, doing the work, obviously, like Kari's yeah. booking everything, you know, oh, yeah. and then Sarah is casting everyone, you know what I mean? And so, like, that's obviously why I was so nervous. But you know what? It's yeah. just to pivot a little bit, moving here to Los Angeles, being surrounded by these, these creatives and these people with these dynamic energies all the time is a constant source of inspiration. Because believe me, when you're not working, when you're auditioning and you're not sure if things are getting to the, to the casting directors or you're not sure if you're doing the right thing, it's very easy to fall into a slump and uh, to be constantly inspired by these people uh, that are in my community is, is amazing. I, I wouldn't be where I am today if it weren't for surrounding myself with these people. Uh, even in Maryland, you know, my, my ninja family with the ninjas movies, that, that was my creative inspiration. And uh, you know, they've all become a, a, a family you know since that point um and i need them i need them in my life if i don't have them i don't feel good yeah um but you know i have some amazing friends out here debbie derryberry the voice of jimmy neutron uh david sobolov the voice of gorilla grod on on the flash uh you know bob bergen porky pig oh my uh, there, there are so many people who are just incredible human beings and uh uh it's good to be out here and surrounded by that. So I just wanted to pivot yeah. to that for a second. Yeah, definitely. Get, get some shout outs. Yeah. Like I was saying to you before I, before we started recording was that, you know, I've been, you know, I live in Virginia, but I've been out to LA a few times to visit and organize things for voiceover for my conference and things like that. And um, it's just like, you get off the plane and there's like this energy, you know, there's like this energy there because being a creative person where no matter what you're doing, whether it's writing or voiceover or doing a YouTube show or yeah. whatever, you know, interviewing someone, I love all of that, you know, and I always love it when I can take what I love doing and put it into action. But when I get to go to LA and, you know, I'm like in meeting after meeting after meeting, but it's not like I'm in meeting after meeting after meeting. You mean lunch after lunch yeah, after lunch. 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 Let's do lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had your kale today? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's it's like, you don't want to leave after that, you know? And then I come home and it's like, oh my gosh, this was an amazing trip. And I got to meet with this person and that person, you know? And I literally, sometimes I don't even talk to my family for like five whole days when I'm there. And they're like, and they don't even question it because they just know, like, it's she's doing what she loves, you know? And I... There's just something about that creative process that makes you come alive and being, like you said, surrounded by those people. It's in itself is inspire, inspiring. You know, it's just. It definitely. really is. Yeah. It really keeps me going. Believe me. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So what about some obstacles? Have there been some obstacles in the industry that you've had so far? Uh, sure. Um, the, the main obstacle is, is trying to get work. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if, if you are fortunate enough to, to, to have an agency that, that solicits you and you're auditioning, you're in a prime spot, uh, whether you're booking all the time or not, you know, that's, that's a lot more than some people can say that, that, that they have. Um, some people rely on, you know, the online websites like voice one, two, three or voices.com, uh, you know, to get their auditions and sometimes they book. Um, but I think the business side of things out here can be very tricky to navigate. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have to have a good demo. You have to really understand what your capabilities are. Um, like I was alluding to earlier, if you come out here and try to do everything, sometimes you'll do nothing. So if you know precisely where it is that your voice, 
uh, uh, meshes well with, you're going to do really well because you know exactly what to focus on and your agents will know what to focus on. Um, you know, getting out and networking, meeting people in person. I know a lot of people who are uh, very much introverted and, and that's, that's a, a, a feat to be able to get out and, and put on a smile and just, you know, be with, surrounded by lots of people and shake lots of hands and just introduce yourself constantly uh, or go to red carpet events. Um, you know, I like my alone time as much as anybody else. So anytime I get out into a large social setting, I, I kind of have to go, oh, okay, let's do this. Um, but, uh, you know, in terms of obstacles other than, than the business, I would say it's really important to be mindful of one's emotional health. Um, this is an industry where you get something and you're riding this high, you're in the studio and you're recording and you're belting things out and you got those endorphins rushing and you feel good. And then you get home and it might be months until you work again, sometimes even years. <clears throat> yeah. So it's crucial to have a support system, um, to have a friendly ear, uh, to listen to you, whether that be a family member, friend, or even a therapist. Um, it is absolutely crucial uh, for people in our industry to take good care of their emotional health. Um, so uh, that can be an obstacle if, if you're not prepared for it. And then, of course, uh, financially, um, you can't go into voiceover expecting that you're going to make a lot of money. You just can't. Uh, yeah, that's the dream is I want to be successful and not have to worry about it. But you can't go in with that expectation because you will – nine times out of 10, be sorely disappointed. You have to have a backup. You have to have something that, that allows you to let your creativity flourish. If you're always worried about your next paycheck, if you're always worried about, you know, how am I going to pay my rent or how am I going to eat? That's going to influence your creativity and people are going to hear it in your auditions. Right. So it's going to perpetuate this, this catch 22 almost of, of not being able to work. So, um, Self-care, emotional support, financial standing, uh, those are the, the big obstacles, at least, that, that I've run into. Yeah. And obviously, one of your biggest successes is being able to do the voice of Donald Duck. <laughs> but it, what else has there been? Because that's, that's a huge one, and I'm sure that you're so thankful, and we're so thankful that we get to hear you. Thank um, you. But... What else have your biggest successes been? Um, gosh. Um, I measure my success based on a couple different things. Um, am I doing good for the world? Am I doing good for me? Am I doing good for my friends and my family? Uh, and am I happy? Um, th those are the measurements of success for me. Yeah. And I, I think it's always a work in progress. Um, speaking of Kari Walgren, uh, I had lunch with her uh, a couple of years ago, and she said something very poignant to me. And that was, don't ever be afraid to let your dreams change. Um, a lot of people get stuck focused on one specific thing, and they don't diversify or see what else is available to them. And... Uh, Sometimes people get into voiceover and say, you know what, this just isn't for me. Uh, maybe I'm going to be a, a casting director, or maybe I want to be a voice director, or maybe I just want to be an artist and go into storyboarding or uh, animation production. Um, there are lots of different facets and avenues that you can jump to, but uh, success is not measured by the money. It's measured by what you give and what you get uh, from the experience. Uh, so for me, just being able to create, uh, being able to say that I've, you know, made a bunch of movies and I've, uh, you know, made some people happy with, with the fact that, you know, my voices have resonated with some people. I mean, look, I remember being a kid and sitting in front of the TV and, and kind of being babysat by Saturday morning cartoons and G.I. Joe and Transformers, <laughs> Jim and the Holograms and Thundercats. I was an 80s child. Um, <laughs> But uh, so to come out here later in life and meet the people who did those voices, it's just like, oh, 
oh, I know you, but you don't know me, and I love you. <laughs> and that was magic to me, that, that experience, and, and being able to meet them and have them be gracious and wonderful people. I, I want to perpetuate that. I want to do the same for, for the next generation. So the Donald Duck circumstance, uh, that, that role, I, I'm so grateful on so many, for so many reasons. Uh, and that's, that's one of them. I get to give back a little bit. I get to seed that experience to the next generation. So I, uh, that tickles me. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I definitely think giving back to, you know, uh, having success and then giving back to others in the community who need it is so important. Actually, on oh, the East yeah. Coast. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are so many opportunities for people uh, in, in voiceover, whether it be New York, uh, Atlanta, you know, uh, Texas, Chicago. There are lots of different hubs that you can find some decent work, but you have to think outside of the box. Um, you know, what, what my motto was always, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the grease. You know, who, who, yeah. how, how can I make as much noise as possible that I'm going to be noticed? And I, that's what got me the role in 2007 for Transformers. I, I campaigned uh, to try to get a role in the Transformers movie. I, I had heard about Elijah Wood uh, auditioning for Lord of the Rings. And what he did is he, he went out into the woods and recorded himself in some, some uh, you know, hobbit garb and, and recited lines from the show. And that got Peter Jackson's attention. And for me, I, I had my artistic friends uh, in the Transformers community help me create a comic book that I could send to Steven Spielberg and Michael Bay. And it worked. Oh my gosh. It absolutely really? worked. Um, actually, hold on a second. I have it right here. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is the comic book that I made uh, so many years ago. And yeah, it was just, it was such a cool experience. If that you really follow cool. me on Facebook, you can see some pictures of it. That's awesome. Uh, it worked. I got the audition. Um, yeah. I didn't get a part in the movie, but then Activision contacted me later on and said, hey, we saw your comic book, and uh, we'd like you to audition for a couple roles. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> the rest was history. So think outside of the box, whatever yeah, you definitely. do. Definitely. For sure. So And the tooting horn. <laughs> No, it's great. Um, so what would you say that two goals that you have for yourself are that you'd like to accomplish in 2019? I like uh, to make it kind of specific and just say the year of 2019 instead of like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so a couple things. Um, I, I'm always learning. I, I love taking workshops and learning from other from other actors. I did an on camera comedy workshop uh, a couple of months ago, uh, just to you know brush up on my skills and learn something completely different. And uh, I think for 2019, I, I'm contemplating dabbling into a little bit of stand up comedy. It's something that utterly terrifies me, utterly terrifies me. But <laughs> From, from what life experience tells me, if something terrifies you, you should probably be running at it. Mm -hmm. So, so stand-up comedy is something I'm probably going to dabble in. Uh, uh, and I think um, travel as much as I can, uh, trying to just experience new things. It's very easy to get kind of caught into a bubble. You know, you get into a routine and there are days when I wake up and I've got nothing to do. There's no audition, so I have to you know, focus on my other creative endeavors, writing or, or producing or, you know, focusing on uh, my hobby, my Transformers collection uh, or, <laughs> or my sweet uh, bird buddy, uh, you know. Um, but I think um, it's really crucial to expand your, your ideas, your world and not just get trapped into the, into the minutia of day-to-day -day life. So, oh, I was I went off on a tangent there. So I'll wake up some days and have no auditions, and some days I'll have 20 auditions that are all due the same day. So it's like I wake up, okay, I guess I know what I'm doing for the rest of the day. I do my auditions, and I go to bed. And <laughs> lather, rinse, repeat. So, you know, you get into this cycle, and it's, it's important to break free of that. Get out of Los Angeles. Go travel. Go do fun things with friends. You know, go to a, a restaurant or a, or a park and – just get out of get out of the Los Angeles uh, day to day. 
I think is really important. So I'm, I'm focused on that. I'm focused on learning new things about myself and discovering what the next chapter is going to be. You know, I, I never thought in a million years that I'd move out to Los Angeles and be playing this character that, that I loved since I was a kid, that my mother loved when she was a kid and my grandparents knew of. Yeah. I mean, who, how does that even happen? So um, I'm trying to figure out what the next adventure is going to be. And uh, it's a work in progress. Awesome. That's exciting. What advice can you give to voice actors that are just starting out? What advice would I give to other actors? Um, I think particularly people just starting out because I think yeah. people that are more experienced might not they may already get it. So, yeah. There's a, there's a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, understand that there is a commitment uh, when it comes to voiceover or being successful in on-camera acting or really anything that you do in life. There is a commitment that's involved. So for voiceover, <clears throat> excuse me, for voiceover, um, you got to have a good microphone. You got to have a good a uh, computer and recording equipment and, uh, you know, a good mobile pre and, and a good studio and a sound space to, to be able to record. You have to invest in workshops to be able to learn from other people. There are so many who come in and say, I don't need to know this. I don't need to train with that person. I'm good. I got a great voice for voiceover. And uh, that will only get you so far. Um, training and acting, taking improv classes, um, there is a lot involved and yes, it requires a financial commitment. Um, so it's important to have all of your equipment together. You have to record a demo. And this is something that I don't compromise on when it comes to giving advice. People often come to me and say, Hey, would you listen to my demo? I put it together myself and, and these are all my favorite voices. <laughs> um, that's fine. And that may work for the online uh, websites to be able to just have something for people to listen to. But let's be honest, you're competing with the best of the best. Uh, if you're here in Los Angeles or, or anywhere, you're competing with the people who have expensive demos. You're yeah. competing with people who have had hours of coaching, people who know the caliber of their voice and know what they're capable of. So when somebody puts together their own demo, I, I discourage it. I, I honestly feel it's important to work with people who are working in the industry, uh, whether that be a, a coach or the person who's recording the demo. So you got to shell out, you know, some, some decent cash. And demos can range anywhere from 750 bucks to $2,500, $3,000. Yeah. Um, and you need to be willing to be able to shell out that money to make yourself sound as good as possible. Because let's face it, you get one shot. If someone listens to your demo and it just doesn't compete, they will never listen to you again. Likely, they will right. never listen to you again. So you have to put your best foot forward. Um, one thing that I usually uh, uh, teach if I ever do a, a workshop is how to discover the capabilities of your own voice. Mm. And uh, I won't give away all my secrets, but <laughs> I would say that if you put aside 90 days to really hone in and discover what you're, what you're capable of, what you can do, you know, how many accents can I do? How many uh, cartoon impressions can I do? How many voice matches can I do of celebrities or otherwise? Uh, you know, what, what, uh, what's my singing voice like? Um, once you delineate all those different things and, and piece them apart, then you can start getting creative with it. Then you can start creating character voices because you already know what you can do. Um, so I, I think that's absolutely crucial uh, to anybody who's getting in. And that's really the advice that I would give. Understand the financial commitment, understand the emotional commitment, understand there are going to be ups and downs all the time. Uh, uh, and, you know, like I did, just focus in on what your specialties are and what you're good at, because those are the things that will help you succeed. Do you feel that you really need to be in L.A.? to make it in the animation voiceover world? That's like a question where it's like, I can either ask you to tell me what I want to hear or I can ask you for the real answer. So I'll ask um, you. I will refer back to 2006. I came out to Los Angeles just to kind of scope out the area. Um, I was invited by my friend David Sobolov and uh, uh, I had 
a meeting with an agency and the question they asked me was, are you based here in Los Angeles? And I said, no, I live in Maryland. <laughs> and they said, oh, okay, thank you very much. And I never heard from them again. Yeah. Um, and they were interested. Let, let, let me be clear. Like, they were interested. They, they were talking amongst themselves, and they, they were talking about the contracts and this and that. And, and everyone was very excited at the prospect that I might join this roster, including myself. And then as soon as I said I live in Maryland, yeah. Um, you got to live in L.A. Um, yeah. That's not to say that that is the same for everybody. Uh, some people find success in other markets. I know there's a, a large uh, animation community in Miami. Um, I believe that's mostly non-union. Uh, so, you know, this is a union town. This is where all the big jobs are. This is where it's regularly happening. And if you're going to do it, you have to meet the people. You have to meet the casting directors. You have to meet the producers. You have to meet the people who are, you know, trying to pitch their pilots to Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and, and uh, you know, in, in my case, sometimes fly to different countries to meet the animation houses that are, that are producing these projects. Um, you can't do it from other places. You have to be here in Los Angeles. Uh, just to give you an example, if a casting director has a choice between somebody they know who has a, a history of doing great things with their voice and a newbie who they've never met before, who do you think they're going to go with? Um, it's usually going to be the people that they know and the people that they trust. So you have to be here. You have to mix it up. You have to, to network. You got to do lunch. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, you need to be able to let your creativity shine. Um, it's not just about having a nice smile or being a nice person. You got to bring the goods and this is how you do it. You come to LA and you show it off and yeah. you wear it on your sleeve and you wear it proud and you let everybody aware of who you are and what you're capable of. Um, my gimmick when I first moved here was I, I had a, I had a Mohawk and uh, it's been running away from my face a little bit. So I've had to kind of change it up a bit. <laughs> But I was known as the Mohawk guy for a very long time, and that was great because people instantly knew, oh, I don't remember his name, but that Mohawk guy was really cool. Like, he had some cool voices and stuff, and that worked in my favor. But nobody would have known that if I wasn't here. So, yeah, yeah if you want to do animation, if that's your heart's desire, you got to come here. And you know what? You don't have to make the move. At least come and check it out. Yeah. You know, come to a convention and, and meet some of the voice actors. Come to like a WonderCon or a San Diego Comic-Con and, you know, uh, meet some of the voice actors. Uh, go to some of the different studios out here. Take a tour over at Warner Brothers, you know, <laughs> at Burbank. Uh, yeah. Do those things and get your lay of the land and determine if this area is right for you. Because sometimes it might not be. This is a big city. Uh, the traffic is pretty congested most of the times. And, um, the weather's different, and we sometimes have earthquakes. Uh, I'll never forget, last year, I, I went outside. There's a mountain range outside of my apartment, and it was all on fire. <laughs> and we had terrible fires here, and I had to think to myself, do I go to bed tonight? Like, it, the mountains are on fire. What do I do? Yeah. So it's important to know what you're getting into, and Los Angeles is a wonderful place. You got the you got the, the beaches, you know, you've got Hollywood, you've got downtown, you've got suburbs all over the place. It's a beautiful place to live, and I, and I adore the people out here, but uh, everybody has to make their own decision when it comes to that. So sure. I would encourage it. If you want it, this is the place to do it. I had to do, and believe me, I, I miss my family and my friends every single day, every single day. Uh, but I know, I know they're just a plane ticket away. Yeah. And, uh, you know, thankfully we have uh, the internets and we yeah. can Skype or Facebook or whatever. So True. it makes it a little better. Yeah, definitely. Um, so do you have any advice for voice actors who are seeking representation from a talent agent? I do. Um, much like I was saying before, get a really good demo. Okay. Get a really good demo and make sure that that demo reflects your capabilities. Because you have to remember something. Most of the agencies out here have someone on their roster that sounds like you and does most of the things you do. So what makes you different? What makes you special? And how are you going to make them money? Um, you have to take those things into consideration. It's not a, 
it's not a pageant where you come out and say, oh, I'm so pretty, look at me. You know, <laughs> don't you want me on your roster? No, oh, okay. Um, I was turned down by, by agencies left and right when I first got here. Um, and to be honest, I was green behind the ears and didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so it took a lot of uh, self-motivation and a lot of work to be able to book my own jobs. Uh, and then I was fortunate enough to uh, start with uh, solid talent out of Burbank. Uh, I'm currently repped by CESD uh, in, uh, in West Hollywood. And, uh, you know, it's a process. So my advice is get a really good demo, understand your capabilities, and just understand that um, your ego may be bruised, that you don't get accepted right away. You just have to be persistent and keep at it. And when you get something really, really big, you can go to an agency and say, hey, I'm bringing this project. Would you like to have me on your roster? Yeah. And a lot of the times they'll say, oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, and, and again, networking, being here in Los Angeles, meeting the agents, letting them know that you're a good person, you know, uh, I, I think that speaks volumes about what your, what your capabilities are. If they like you, they're going to want to work with you. Nobody wants to get into the booth with somebody who's a sourpuss, you know, or who complains all the time or who's just always negative or angry. Nobody wants to deal with that. So you got to put your best foot forward. They want to see that you're a good person and they, they can work with you. And once they do, the world is your oyster, if you like oysters. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So what are some projects that you're working on now that you're allowed to talk about? Because I know there's so many NDAs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Uh, there's so many things I wish I could just. <laughs> um, it's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. Um, I was really uh, pleased to, to uh, be on Cartoon Network uh, for We Bear Bears, uh, an episode called Wingmen. Uh, where I played the Larka 2 uh, recently. I've done some work on the Loud House, uh, on Nickelodeon, Bunsen is a Beast, uh, The Adventures of Kid Danger, uh, so many fun things. The, the biggest thing right now that I've been working on for a couple years uh, is the Tom, Tom and Jerry show. Awesome. Um, I can't say who I play just yet. But, uh, <laughs> I, I've done... Uh, Many, many episodes with uh, one of my voiceover friends, Chris Edgerly, uh, from The Simpsons. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's, a, it's been an amazing experience. So I'm very proud of that. And I can't wait to tell people more. Um, but for now, I would just say, you know, keep a lookout for more Mickey and the Roadster Racers. Uh, we just debuted season two of Chip and Dale's Nutty Tales. And, uh, uh, you know, we're recording season three of Roadster Racers. So, uh you know, keep your eyes peeled for more stuff. Uh, there, there may be some more Donald on the way, and there may be some other things coming too. Cool, that's exciting. Yeah. Um. So, do you have any upcoming appear appearances that you'd like to tell us about? Like, do you and do you offer any coaching or classes for other voice actors? Um, I will be at WonderCon uh, next month uh, on a panel with some of my peers, uh, <laughs> some amazing voice actors and actresses. Um, the, the details of that have not been solidified, so I don't want to just put right. it out, you know, who's going, but, uh, right. yeah, that'll be next month. It'll be the day after I return from Tokyo, Japan. So I hope I'm not deliriously cross-eyed and tired. Wow. Um, Are you going for, is that for, uh, just a vacation or is it for an event? In I'm just going to eat all the sushi. Got it. <laughs> I'm going to eat all the sushi and awesome. my, my, my best friend wanted me to come and meet them. We're going to do the, the, the live Mario Kart experience where you get oh. to dress up and drive around town in the go-kart. Exciting. I know. Like, <laughs> they said, do you want to do that? And I said, yes, yes, I want to do that. <laughs> okay. So yeah, just going for fun. Uh, cool. And, you know, like I said before, to get out of LA and just clear yeah. my head uh, uh, and come back refreshed and, and with a different perspective. Um, mm -hmm. Do I offer coaching? I've kind of resisted doing that for some time. I love teaching. Yeah. Teaching is something that, that I've always, I would say, been okay at. Um, I love imparting knowledge to people who are hungry uh, and excited to learn. Um, I do teach a, a workshop, like I said, about discovering the capabilities of your voice. 
Um, if people are interested in that, I, I would say certainly feel free to reach out to me, but I don't have anything uh, presently on the market that I, that I would solicit. Um, I really don't do one-on-one -on -one coaching as of yet. Um, I, I kind of still feel like a newbie in a lot of, in a lot of respects. And it's, it's this weird question of, do I feel that I have the chops to, to teach like all of my peers who have been doing this for decades? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I haven't wanted to jump into that field just yet because I feel like I'm still learning. Right. And if I'm going to teach somebody, I want to give them the best information possible. So um, I'm, I'm very specific as to what I will teach. Um, but uh, other than that, sometime down the line, I'm, I'm sure that'll be a factor. Such an honor to have you on the show and to talk with you. And I, I really learned, like, I learned so much. And I, I'm always so interested to find out, like I said, people's stories and their background. And I just wish you so much continued success with Donald and with everything you do. And I definitely um, can't Thank wait you. to see what you do next. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah. <laughs>